sometimes God gives a word of, of preparation that we get, you know, that we start preparing for something that he's doing, that he's, we start getting ready. And when we heed it, and we just go for it, whether we understand it or not, and whether the thing that we are preparing for has um, presented itself or not, you know, uh, when, when we actually just heed that word and the thing comes later, you, you, everything just falls into place and it's just something, something amazing. And I think that's the essence of faith. So if we look at, at Noah, I mean, what a word God gave Noah. <laughs> Spend your life to build a giant boat from wood. Okay? Thanks. So imagine God gives you, God gives you a, a word. There's going to be rain. Rain? What's rain? They never saw rain. So build a boat. They were not at the ocean. There's going to be a great amount of water. I mean, this guy never saw a marina with ships in it. He never saw a ship in his life. God gave him a word, and he started building a boat according to the pattern of, of what God showed him. That's preparation. Okay? And I don't know, maybe someone may know more than me, but it was in excess of 100 years that he worked on that boat. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's a long time to be committed to something that... Um, Gets you ready for something that you have no idea is gonna, what it's going to be like. Okay? So in 2017, God gave me a word on preparation. And he, said, he just said, prepare. But in my heart, I knew I needed to get all our practical things in order because there's something that he needed to do. So he said the word prepare, but he... I understood in my heart, we really need to get ready for people coming. And that we were still there in Equestria. We were just one year in Equestria. Okay, so we painted the wall. The first time we painted the back wall black, okay? And we, I built a stage and, you know, saw a sound system, you know, and just burned my credit card. But we just, we just went for it. So to get ready... And we got the streaming stuff ready. We got the, you know, and people so, so graciously gave. And we, we have the, the computer and, and the camera, or the other camera blew up, but we got one. And so God said prepare. And, and people didn't really understand what for. I mean, why do you want to get all this broadcast equipment? Why do you want to get um, all this technical stuff what for? I mean, we're a small little church in Equestria with a few people coming, you know. And, you know, he said, and God gave me a word. He said, when the people, are come, when the people come, where are they going to sit? So I ordered 50 more chairs, okay? If, if we could squeeze more chairs into that place, <laughs> I would, okay? So, but it was on a word for preparation. So, and... We were just ready, and God said, you know, do a morning devotional type thing. And I just started, and then we heard the lockdowns are coming because there's COVID. So I was ready for something that we had no grid for. And when it hit, I took the computers and the cameras and we built this little, who remembered the little studio I built in my garage? And you see that beige pole in the middle of the... <laughs> so, um, so we had a little studio, and I mean, we had every day, we had a morning devotional service, and um, for two years, every day. Later on, maybe just not Sundays, but six days a week, and later on, five days a week. Right, but for two years, every morning... No, six days a week. Only Saturdays I didn't, I didn't bring a word later on. Okay, so God said prepare, and when the thing came, we were prepared. And uh, so I kind of have the same type of sense again of preparation. 
but it's, it's a bit in a different way. So, um, I mean, how God has, God has blessed us to, you know, to be able to really make space for more people to come and sit. I mean, He opened up the doors to this place. So, here we are. But there's something that God wants to do is He wants to prepare His people. God wants to prepare you for whatever you will face. God wants to prepare you for whatever would be required of you for, you know, to, to minister to people, to, to give some testimony, to give some kind of answer to people, but also to be prepared when fruit is required. Also to be prepared, you know, for whatever unforeseen thing may come. So I just, I really feel like a preparing word again. But I feel it more in the context of our hearts, our lives, the way we think, the way we act. So I want to just start off with Hebrews chapter 2. So today is a very specific word um, you know, and according to your heart and your, your uh, conscience, you can be ready for any level of preparedness. If you, if you feel in your life preparing means, okay, get off the grid and, uh, you know, have a vegetable garden and all that, then that's it, then do it. So um, I, I'm not even making fun of that level of preparedness. I mean, that's a good thing. If the Holy Spirit is saying you do it. So, um, but now Hebrews chapter 2 says, Since all this is true, obviously speaking of Hebrews chapter 1, and he just spoke of the ministering spirits who the angels sent out in the service of those who are to inherit salvation. He says, Since all this is true, we ought to pay much closer attention than ever to the truths that we have heard, lest in any way we drift past them and slip away. So it's interesting that King James says it a bit different. He says, uh, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. But the, the them is in italics. So we don't want to slip away from the truth, and we don't want the, the truth to slip away from us. Which comes down to this. We need to be prepared in the Word and in prayer. So every service is not only I'm getting a sermon prepared for the Sunday service, but it's a whole life of preparation leading somewhere. So if we're going to see revival as a body together, I'm speaking globally uh, all over the world. God is saying all over the world, people receiving a word from the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's been prophesied for decades. Revival is supposed to be imminent. It's supposed to be here. But if we're going to have revival, if we're going to have a widespread of out, uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, in our town, in our, you know, congregation, even in many churches, uh, in the nation or worldwide, somewhere there's going to be people that will draw close. Somewhere, somehow, there will be people preparing their hearts for this thing. Somewhere people will lay down certain things and focus their attention and give him their all, their, their yes. And, and mostly, you know, it will be in word and in, and in prayer. Yes, there's practical things, but in, in Acts, the apostles also said, uh, listen, we're not supposed to be weighing tables all the time. Let's just see, so, find someone who's full of the Holy Spirit and of a good report and let them do that while we uh, give ourselves to prayer and the Word, and the reading of the Word. So there's a, I, I want to lay emphasis on, on that kind of preparing, where we should pay close attention to everything that we think we know. So I, I feel an urgency in my heart 
that we pay attention to what we would know as, you know, foundational doctrine. What we would know as, this is what, a, what makes you a Christian. All right? Which is, we believe that we are saved by grace through faith, which is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. So it's, where is the HDMI over here? One day we will be so prepared that we don't use HDMI anymore. My goodness, it works for a VCR and a TV, but for broadcasting it's not great. <laughs> okay. So God wants to prepare our hearts, and He wants us to be in the Word, and He wants the Word to be in us. And um, so, which means that our lives are called now into a deeper level of fellowship with Him. So God is requiring of us as a body a greater um, commitment to relationship to Him. Because in times where thing, everything seems to run smooth, everything seems to go the way it's supposed to go, a natural response is to kind of disengage. Someone else's faith is carrying the burden. Or even it's not really necessary to engage because everything's comfortable. It's not really necessary to, to really engage. And you, you can see that uh, in general by the urgency with which people need prayer for something. You, you can see when it starts to go tough, the urgency increases. So God says before... The urgency is needed because of the things that surround you. He says he wants to give you a heads up to prepare you so that you engage with urgency even if it is not directly needed today. So we don't want to be on the back foot. Okay, so there's so many scriptures that I, that I put in here, but I'm just going to kind of speak and see you. See, where we go. So, we don't want to be on the back foot, but we want to be on the offensive. Okay, let me just qualify that statement. I'm not saying we want to offend people, but we want to be on the attack, so to speak, instead of trying to find out why we are under attack. So, James chapter 4 says, if you're a friend of the world... You take your stance as an enemy towards God. Okay? But then he, he goes on. Let's just read it. So, I mean, he's, he's taking out the whip to whoever is writing this. To. <laughs> so, he says, uh, verse 2, you are jealous and covet what others have, and you des your desires go unfulfilled, so you become murderers. To hate is to murder as far as your hearts are concerned. You burn with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification and the contentment and the happiness that you seek. So you fight and war. You do not have because you do not ask. Or you do ask God for them and yet fail to receive because you ask with the wrong purpose and evil selfish motives. Your intention is when you get what you desire to spend it in sensual pleasure. So that's kind of a state of disengaging and, and comfort and just going with, with kind of what the, the flesh desires. Okay, now he says, verse 4, for you are like unfaithful wives, etc. Then he says, second off, so whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of God. Or do you suppose, now listen how awesome this is, that the Scripture is speaking to no purpose, that the Spirit whom God has caused to dwell in us yearns over us, and He yearns for the Spirit to be welcomed with a jealous love. So God yearns to be welcomed in our hearts. So He wants to be welcomed now. He wants us to engage in relationship, in prayer, in, in the Word now. He wants to have us totally so with that, I'm not saying oh, people, 
you know, I, I'm not saying, okay, you're not allowed to have a bride with your friends. You just must sit and pray all day. That's not what I'm saying. But let your heart belong to the Spirit. Let your yes be to, to Him. And whenever He prompts you, go for it. So He prepares us so that He can indwell us. And when He indwells us, when He moves, we move. When He speaks, we speak. So that we can be a vessel filled with Him. So that He can be made visible on this earth. Now, if we um, are primarily a friend of the world, it is an enemy of this relationship. So if you say yes to one thing, you say no to another. Because you cannot split yourself in time and space. You, you, if you engage in one thing, you disengage in another. That's just the, the reality. So, God wants us to engage with Him. And how wonderful is that? I mean, that, that's not a punishment, is it? That's wonderful. So, but I think that the big thing is we don't discern exactly how much we need salvation. We don't discern exactly how far away we are of the reality that He has for us. Okay? So there's something that He wants to reveal in us and through us, and that something is so much greater than even the greatest comfort or even the greatest glamour that any riches of this world can give you. It's so much greater than that, that we have no grid for it. We have no hook to hang it on. So our understanding doesn't allow for us to have a clear picture of really exactly what it is that God is doing on the inside of us. It's far surpassing all knowledge and all experience. So the closest that our psyche at this moment can understand is to have a new car. <laughs> so, or to have a nicer house, or to have this or this or this. All good things, and yes, God does want to, I mean, I just said He wants your storage places to be filled. God wants to bless you. I, I think it's a horrible thing to say that God wants to keep His people poor. No, God wants you to be blessed. But He wants you to be blessed. He wants to add those things to your life. He, he doesn't want to add you to those things. He doesn't want the things to, to own you. He wants you to have the things as, as a testimony of His blessing on your life. All of this must testify about Him. So He, he needs to become visible in everything that we do everything that we show everything so that means uh, no more hiding so I remember years ago I just remember it now and it was also like a little clip in the intro but but Prophet Kubis Farinsberg used to say those who don't know we spent we, we walked with them for years so uh, and he says the church needs to become visible the church needs to come out of the closet, you know, and be made visible. So, so we need to stop being in hiding about the glory that God has placed on the inside of us. If it's worth something, let's, let's tell it to someone. Let's, let's show someone. Let's demonstrate it somewhere. So, which means that suddenly every person you meet um, is on your radar, so, yes, I'm also, some days I don't want to speak to anyone. I just want to just go sit somewhere. <laughs> and those, those times are good because then your full attention is there. But when you go out in the world, we need to, wherever it is required, wherever it is needed, be able to give an answer of the hope that's dwelling on the inside of us. Okay? So, which means there's a certain level of preparedness that we need to engage in. And if you are there, wonderful, but there's more. Okay? So that's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm, this is, today is, is more of an exhortation. It's not a rebuke. It is, let us also. Okay? I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians 15, where he, where he speaks of, 
of the first man, Adam, and you know, the second man, Christ, the last Adam. He says the first man is of the earth earthy, and the second man is, is the Lord from heaven. So then he says, as is those who are of the earth, um, they are like the first man, Adam, earthly minded. But those who are of heaven is like him who is from heaven, heavenly minded. And then he says this, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, and we all come from there, so we must also bear the image of the man from heaven. But if you read in the Greek, and the, and the Amplified Translation also adds it there, it's an exhortation. He says, so let us also uh, bear the image of the man from heaven. So that means the integrity needs to be there, the fruit needs to be there, uh, you know, the love needs to be there, so we need to be prepared so that we are not caught unawares whenever something is needed from us and we can't give an answer. Whether we can't give an answer from the Word or whether we can't give an answer in literally healing the sick that is in front of us. So we need to be prepared in this way. If there's a sick person that needs an answer, now we can't go fast and pray for 40 days and speak in tongues for six hours to heal this guy. You need to lay hands and there must be power to, to heal this person. So it's all given at the cross. It's all paid for at the cross. It's all already finished. It's all already given. Um, yet it doesn't manifest if we don't constantly engage with him in relationship. And that is what God is inviting us, drawing us closer into. So the thing is, there's a, there's a, like a time where things, I mean, we've seen the greatest actual period of peace and prosperity since World War II in the West, I think in the history of the earth. So, but things are starting to get a bit bumpy. Okay, that's just the reality around us. I mean, Europe is suddenly also a little bit caught unawares. And... Um, and everyone is losing their minds. I mean, it's more a, it's more a war on the thoughts that's, that you, and, and the belief system that you have, and the whole grid that is, has been functioning well up, up until now. It's an attack on those ideas, on those fundamental ideas. Now, if you're going to be vague in your thoughts, if you're going to disengage because everything is running smoothly, then when the time comes when it is challenged, you will just be swept along with it. When dangerous ideologies come or when, when all kinds of strange ideas in doctrine come and people are not prepared in the word and in prayer, then people, let me just put it this way, the people that are swept up on it tend to be the people that are not prepared. Okay? And with that, I'm not saying, okay, now we need to go and be afraid of anything. No, no. I'm just saying engage in the Word and engage in prayer. Engage in a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because it will be needed in the time that we're moving into. So, I mean, it's really already needed now, <laughs> if we're honest. So, whoever you find on the street, in the shopping center, at the petrol station, wherever, the, every person you meet will need Christ. Okay. Right, let's just go to Ephesians chapter 5. Okay. So Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Therefore be imitators of God. Copy Him. Follow His example. As well-beloved children imitate their father. And walk in love. So that's non-negotiable. If, if I'm not intentional about walking in love, I may be swept up in my own emotions. When I'm challenged about something trivial, and instead of responding in love, I 
respond taking a big hammer and smashing someone, someone because I want to win the argument instead of winning someone's heart. Esteeming, delighting in one another as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Slain offering, sacrifice to God for you so that it became a sweet fragrance. And then he calls it out. He says, but immorality, sexual vice, and impurity, lustful, rich, wasteful living, and greediness must not even be named among you. So the Western civilization has gone so far in that. It's so, uh, it's so everywhere because of technology, you know, and smartphones and everything. People are so used to uh, graphic sexual displays and all kinds of things. So, so it, because... Because it is so everywhere, uh, it's, a, it's a much greater threat to people's personal lives at this stage. Okay? So now he says it should not even be named. So, so it's not something to be justified. It's something to repent of and walk away from, whatever form it takes. Okay? And then he says in verse 4, So let there be no filthiness, obscenity, indecency, nor foolish and sinful talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting or becoming, but instead voice your thankfulness to God. So instead of saying whatever four-letter word you want to say, in the, why don't you just say in the moment, thank God. <laughs> that may be, may be a good thing to replace it with. Okay. So for be sure of this, that no person practicing sexual vice or impurity in thought or in life, or one who is covetous, who has lustful desire for property of others and is greedy for gain, uh, for any effects in idolatry, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay, so what he's saying there is if you're a friend of the world and their practices, you, you, you put yourself in enmity. You resist, literally resist the kingdom to do something. So God wants his kingdom, his authority, his way of living his word, his power to indwell you, to be in you, okay? We know the kingdom of, of God is not in talk but in power. We know that the kingdom of God is not by observation, but the kingdom is on the inside of you. So if the inside of you is filled with the opposite of the kingdom, then you push out the stuff. So it doesn't mean that God doesn't want it to give you to, but, but you need to willfully, intentionally, Welcome it in, receive it. An example of this, in John chapter 8, um, Jesus speaks to the Pharisees. And he says to them, you are of your father the devil. But they say, we have one father, even God. He says, if God were your father, you would have welcomed me, for I'm from him. He says, but you practice the lusts of your father, because you seek to kill me. And he was a murderer from the beginning. He was a liar from the beginning and the father of lies. So he says, why are you unable to hear what I'm saying? Why, are you, why don't you hear what I'm saying? It is because you are, you are not able to hear. You're not, it says, my words have no entrance in you. So, <clears throat> on the one hand, we have a message that takes the grace of God and the finished work of the cross to such an extreme that you have no role to play, which means the message says this, and I'm calling it the message because it's not the gospel. The message says this, that you, because you are, he already died for you, because you are already forgiven, because he's done everything for you, because it's finished, it means everyone is already saved. You don't even have to believe because the grace is so great. Okay, but when will that word enter your heart? Because if the word cannot enter your heart, you cannot be born again. And Jesus said in John chapter 3, speaking to Nicodemus, he said, if... Uh, you know, you must be born again to see the kingdom. So if, you, if you're no, never going to be born again because you resist the word, 
Never believe it. Never finds entrance into your heart. How will you inherit it? So we, we should not engage with the world in spirit and soul and in body and then expect to get the results of the kingdom because that's not going to happen. But every second, God extends His grace, and He says, listen, there's grace, just receive it, just repent. So what is repent? Repent doesn't mean you tell the whole world about all your dirty washing. Repent means this, you change the way you think. That means within yourself, you turn away from the thing that you've been busy with. You disengage, and you engage with Christ. That's repentance. So it is a turning, it's an inward change, but it is in words and in actions. So God requires us to disengage from something that is actually coming after us to destroy us. So, for instance, if I say to a child, do not put your hand on a warm stove plate, okay? Rather... You know, what's good for hand? I don't know. Have the soft glove. I don't know. <laughs> so as long as the child puts his hand on the st stove plate, he will not be enjoying whatever else God wants to put in his hand. Do you get what I'm saying? So God wants you to, as quickly as possible, disengage from the thing that is actually destroying you. So we need to, to, to discern how much we need salvation. If we can, I'm talking about your reality and your manifestation right now. I'm not talking about what is already given to us in the spirit. I mean, according to that, you are holy, blameless, spotless before God. You are awesome. That's available. But if that word doesn't come into your heart, somewhere it needs to be believed. Somewhere it needs to be appropriated. It needs to be taken and incorporated. Incorporated literally meaning you make it part of your body. You take it in. Right, so God wants us to engage fully with our hearts, with our minds. The word that we know to be true, Jesus died. His blood paid for our sins. Um, that means your forgiveness and your healing. So, really, what does that mean? It means you're truly standing before God when you believe this. You're really standing before God, holy and blameless. Okay? God wants us to understand that through the death of the cross, you became poor, became, he became so poor that you may became, become rich. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. So, God wants you to stand in a supernatural supply of finances. That is... I mean, even if the manifestation of it is slower than what you would have had when you did your own thing, it's worth so much because it comes from Him. But if we really get it and we receive the salvation in that area, the flow just opens up. There's no limit to it. But there is a limit to what we can do. Okay, so we're struggling to discern how much we need salvation. Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says the following. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the truth that we need to pay attention to. For it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. And then he says in verse 17, for in the gospel... The righteousness which God ascribes to you is revealed. So he reveals a, a righteousness which is really Jesus' own righteousness. By the Spirit within you. It's imputed to you. It's given to you. Okay. And it brings you life. The moment that righteousness hits you, you can check out Romans 8 verse 10. It brings you life. Okay. And then that life brings it just flows through you and it brings salvation to everything else. So, there's salvation in the gospel. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 speaks along the same lines. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to evangelize by preaching the glad tidings, that not with verbal eloquence, lest the cross should be deprived of force and emptied of its power. For the story and the message of the cross is sheer absurdity and folly to those who are perishing and on their way to perdition. But to us who are being saved, it is the manifestation of the power of God. Okay, so you are saved, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, you are saved. Um, if, if any person b believes in his heart and confesses with, with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we are saved by grace through faith. Not grace alone, not faith alone. The two are together. By grace through faith, which is not of yourselves, it's a gift. Okay. So, there's an initial salvation that comes to you. But then there's an ongoing salvation that happens in you. And there's so many scriptures, but let's just take 2 Corinthians 3 that says, verse 18, as we behold him, we are changed, we behold him in the mirror, in a glass, in the word. So the word is that mirror, it's that glass. And when we behold him, we are transformed in ever-increasing splendor, ever-increasing glory, uh, into his very own image from the glory that faded which is the law of Moses to the ever increasing glory that's revealed in the face of Jesus let me just simplify it when you behold Jesus you're turned into his image so behold it's, n it's not enough to hear that if you behold Jesus you are transformed, you agree with it, you rejoice in it, and then you go home and you never behold. God is calling us to behold Him in righteousness, Psalm 16. Be and awake with His likeness. God wants us to engage with Him, to look, to, to seek Him out, to search Him out, to spend time with him, to, to look to him. And that will prepare you for whatever comes. So then there's no fear. Because you have him, and you have him in an increasing way manifesting in your life. So there's like a momentum that starts building up. But the momentum builds up as you look. So look. <laughs> okay. Back to Ephesians 5. Man, I never even finished that thought. Verse 11. Take no part in, have no fellowship with the fruitless deeds and enterprises of darkness, but instead let your lives be so in contrast as to expose and reprove and convict them. For it is a shame to even speak of or mention the things that such people practice in secret. So we don't have TV programs about it. Oh, this one exposed and that one exposed on Facebook. No, we don't talk about it. We talk about Jesus. We preach the gospel. We don't talk about other people's mis mistakes and sins and shame. And We don't talk about that. We talk about the answer. We spread the good news abroad. But when anything is exposed and reproved by the light, it is made visible and clear. So what is the exposing and the, the reproving? Everything that is in, on the inside of us, we engage with the light and we bring it into the light before God. So you can take that to 1 John 1. If we dwell in the light as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us and keeps us cleansed from sin. 
in all its forms and manifestations. So you dwell in the light. Not you go accuse someone to bring to light their issues. That's, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, your own heart, search my heart, O oh God, and see if there's any wrong thing within me. You be transparent before God. Say, Lord, here I am. If there's anything I need to adjust, tell me. If there's anywhere where my doctrine is not right, show me. If there's anything that I need to adjust in my life, show me. Okay? And if you really ask that honestly, he will answer you so fast your hair will curl. And he will show you. He will, he will show certain things to you. So now he says, Therefore, he says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine upon you and give you light. I want light. So he says, Awake. 1 Corinthians 15 says, also says, Awake. He says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. So there's certain things that we say we're struggling with, but actually, really, we've been petting it. And we've, there's certain things that we've been um, allowing in our lives not to be aggressive against it because, I don't know, for some reason we tolerated it. But how about, we, before we want to rearrange the whole world, how about we bring our own hearts and open it up before the light of God and says, okay, Lord, here I am. Where do I miss it? What must I adjust? How can I prepare? How can I get ready so that I can actually be of some use to you? Okay? Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ shall make day dawn upon you and give you light. Look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully, worthily, accurately, not as the unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. So whatever opportunity you have to engage with God and whatever opportunity you have to bring what you have received from God to, to others, seize it. Seize the opportunity. Seize the day. You know? <laughs> okay. What's that movie? Okay. Therefore, and this is an important part of this today, therefore do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. So we, we need to be more accurate in what God has called us for, specific. What do you want me to do now? What do you want me to do today? What do you want me to say? Let's not be vague. Listen, if you, if you look at people who are kind of on the attack in a big mob and they just, you know, spray accusations, you know, like a machine gun, you know, so you see them all over, okay, and they band people into groups and you're guilty because you're part of a group, you know, group identity politics, okay, you just, you're guilty because you are of this demographic or that demographic. Throughout history, that has always proven to lead to destruction. That's never a good plan. Okay. But when you ask someone like that a question, or when they speak out with their accusations, it's always vague. It's never precise. Have you thought about that? Oh, you always do that. Okay. Who did it? When did it happen? Exactly what happened? Where's the proof? And you hear crickets. Yes, but everybody knows. Oh, who's the everybody? What is it exactly that they know? Where's, where's the authority on which you say that? Where do you come up with this idea? And just by asking those questions, sometimes you just dismantle the whole threat. Okay, so God wants us to be articulate, specific, uh, intentional, like 
laser surgery. <laughs> Accurate in our language, in our thoughts, in our intentions, in our direction. It's, it's not a time, the time we're entering is not a time to be vague. It's a time to be specific. Okay. Do not be vague, thoughtless, and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. So it's, it's a good thing to understand the time that, that we are living in and what is required of us. God is required, requiring of us our attention. If there's one thing that, is, that the world is trying to take from you, it is your attention. And if you don't believe me, just get that thing on your phone switched on that tells you what your smartphone use is during the day. <laughs> okay? They all, everyone is competing for your attention. God says, hey, I want your attention. Do not get drunk with wine, that is debauchery, but ever, be ever filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. Speak out to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, offering praise with voices and instruments and making melody with all your heart to the Lord. At all times, for everything, giving thanks. There's the thanksgiving again. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when something comes, hey, give thanks. It's always good. Philippians 4, 1 Thessalonians 5, give thanks. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, so then we're not going to have a wedding now, so I'm going to stop now <laughs> with the scripture. <laughs> okay, God is, God is just asking us to engage with him. 